Hi everybody, welcome to Dr. Manny's YouTube Learn Shops. In this session, we look at some of the theoretical perspectives that you'll encounter in nursing, and this deals with scientific inquiry, but it's just an overview. Now the learning outcomes for this session are that you should be able to, at the end of this session, discuss the assumptions and nature of science, identify certain tools of scientific inquiry, explain what the scientific method is, question the criticisms of positivism and the scientific method, examine an alternative view of social reality, such as qualitative methodologies, and consider the implications for your professional nursing practices. So let's look at what is science. We need to understand what science actually is. And science is considered to be something of a process that seeks truth. It's considered to be the study of nature and the behavior of natural things and the knowledge that we get when we use it. It's a science of a particular branch of science. And there are many different types of sciences, such as physics or chemistry or biology. And the goal of science is to investigate to understand, to explain the empirical world. All right, then we need to understand the concept of empiricism or what is empirical. Empirical is based on observation. You've got to be able to observe it. And in that way, you experience it. You see it firsthand. It's verifiable. That means you can prove it. The term comes from the Greek word experience, empiria. And empirical evidence then is the information received by the senses of the observer or the person doing the experiment. And this is particularly done by observation and documentation of patterns and behavior through the experimentation process. And this process is central to the scientific method, which we'll be discussing later. If you look at the cyclic model in front of you, you've got observation, induction. You're thinking about what could be. Then you've got deduction. You deduce what has been seen. You test it. You evaluate and you come up with a conclusion. Or you may observe again. Another variation of empirical observation is induction of the hypothesis or the questions from your curiosity. You're wondering why. And because you wondered why, you build a theory. And with that theory, you make certain deductions and have certain predictions about what could be. After that, you do empirical testing. You actually do it. You actually do the experiment to test your predictions. And then after that, you evaluate the theory to see whether it is true or it's not true. That's empiricism. So empiricism basically then means originating in or based on observation or experience. It relies on observation and the experiences that you observed. And it's capable of being proven or verified or, as I said, disproved by the observation or the experiment that you did. Now let's relate science to nursing. And the science of nursing essentially focuses on the development of knowledge. Why? To build a scientific base for clinical practice. And in doing so, we may prevent disease, and further disabilities for our patients or the population. It's to manage symptoms which are caused by illness, to enhance end of life or palliative care. Essentially, it's to develop nursing research. Nursing research can be empirical research, which again, we already said, empiricism and therefore empirical research is based on 
observed and measured phenomena. And it derives knowledge from actual experiences rather than from a theory of belief, which is subjective. Specific research questions can be answered in this way. So let's consider some of the basic assumptions that are advocated by science. Science advocates that there's order. There's a natural law. Nature is considered orderly. It's got regularity, which means it's consistent and it's predictable. And it's arranged in patterns, so it's very, very structured. The natural laws or the laws of nature describe order. And there are principles. And the principles govern natural phenomena of the world. That's how science sees it. Individuals and social structure are part of nature, so therefore both exhibit order. Look at the sign relation to natural law. Natural law is based on principles and truth. It's combining knowledge with understanding. And it exists and applies anywhere in the universe, regardless of the location. And it can't be changed. What is there is there. So natural law then is a theory in ethics and philosophy that says all human beings possess intrinsic values that govern us, us our reasoning and our behaviour. It also maintains that these rules of right or wrong are inherent in people. It means they exist in people and they're not created by society or anything else. They're natural. Natural laws are considered to be concise descriptions of natural phenomena. And the scientific method then is the systematic study orderly of the natural world through observation and experimentation, as we already said. And while these theories describe the causes of natural phenomena, natural laws only describe the relationships between the natural phenomena. Natural laws are also, as we will see, known as scientific laws. And as you go through your course, you'll come and become more familiar. And the scientific laws imply a cause and effect between observed elements and must always apply under the same conditions. They're always the same. The universal law, however, of course and effect, states that for every effect, there's a definite cause. And likewise, every cause there's a definite effect. Your thoughts, behaviours, actions create specific effects that manifest and create your life as you know it. Now, consider. There are three criteria that have to be met to establish a cause and effect relationship. The cause must occur before the effect Whenever the cause occurs, the effect must also occur and there must not be another factor that can explain the relationship between the cause and effect. There's only one factor and these are related to variables. As I said, Natural laws arise from a process known as the scientific method, and we'll be reviewing that. The scientific method essentially is a systematic study, very orderly, very organized, of the natural world through observation and experimentation. And this process, or this method, provides scientists with rigorous frameworks to objectively study the natural world. What's happening out there? Using the scientific method, natural laws can be verified, proven, through experiments conducted by independent observers. 
So look, I mean, examples again. When natural laws are mentioned, one of the most common scientific disciplines that comes to mind is physics. The law of physics, for example, includes concepts such as Newton's law of universal gravitation. This law describes the attractive forces of gravity that exist between two masses. Others, for example, natural laws are also found in chemistry. One of the most important laws in chemistry is the law of conservation of matter. This law states that the matter can neither be created nor destroyed. Then you've got biology. And biology too has laws that describe natural phenomena. An excellent example is Mendel's law of segregation. And this law describes how physical traits are passed from one generation to the next, which you would have covered when you did your basic medical sciences, when you looked at genetics. So, basic assumptions also include determinism. And these are all events that are completely determined by previous existing causes. Determinism, it's a philosophy, theory that all events, including your moral choices, are completely determined by previously existing causes. You've got phenomena, and phenomena have natural causes. An example could be a pregnant woman. She goes into premature labour. That's the effect. Then there's got to be a reason why she went into labour. The cause. And it has to be identified and understood. Another example could be a person who has a stroke. The stroke is the effect. But there's got to be a reason, a cause, that can be identified why he had that stroke. Another assumption is about phenomena. A phenomena, a phenomena or a phenomenon is the result of something. And it may be something that you might want to investigate when you do your research. A phenomenon may have several different causes. So for example, the phenomena cardiovascular disease, the causes could be related to smoking, diet, stress, sedentary lifestyle, etc. The phenomena of menopause, the causes, well, it's a normal process or it could be a deficiency related to disease. The search for an explanation is why things are what they are. That's one of the aims of science. So again, if we go back to the basic assumptions related to science and we look at empiricism. Empiricism is about truth. And truth has to be demonstrated, according to science, objectively. Empiricism gains knowledge, as we already said, from direct observation and experience. And the knowledge comes from your senses, your five senses. It's directly observed, or it can be indirectly observed, the effect of something. And the important thing is it can be measured. It's objective. So for example, an example would be vital signs. You can objectively determine what your blood pressure is, your heart rate. Can you determine objectively the presence of skin inflammation? Maybe, yes or no. What you see is what you see, and you see it objectively. Then you've got a variant. Direct knowledge is something that we gain from observing something happening. Indirect knowledge is seeing the effect of something. These are two important concepts related to empiricism and science. Now let's review another concept, the nature of science. What's scientific knowledge? Well, scientific knowledge is considered to be partially the product of your imagination. 
and it's tentative. I've put the word there indefinite. Tentative is indefinite. It's not definite knowledge. It's partially a function of human subjectivity. And remember that subjective data is information from you, your point of view. So for example, subjective data could be symptoms. And this includes feelings, perceptions, concerns, not measurable. I mean, you can't measure anxiety. You can't measure fear. This is subjective. However, scientific knowledge, as we already said, has observation. However, it combines observation with inference. An inference is just another way of saying probability. This is probably the reason why. But scientific knowledge is grounded in evidence. So when you look at the pathway for scientific knowledge, a question is asked, a hypothesis or a theory is formulated, data is collected, analyzed, and then does it fit your theory? And if it does, then you tell people about it. If it doesn't, then you may go back and review your hypothesis. If it does, you may go back to review your hypothesis. Objective data is observable. It's measurable. So for example, objective data is signs. I mean the signs, I mean here, objective data, their blood pressure. Well, I can see it. Their blood pressure is 180 on 110. It's measurable. Their heart rate is a tachycardia, 165. So you have two forms of data, subjective data, which is not measurable. And this could be your patient's symptoms. But then you've got objective data, which is observable. It's measurable. It's obtained through observation, physical examination, laboratory and diagnostic testing, for example. It's grounded in evidence. Let's look at it from another point of view now. Scientific data also requires imagination. It requires ideas. And these ideas originate in the human mind. And then they're analyzed, and they're sorted, and they're used, and they're stored for future usefulness. And there are many, many great scientists who saw things that other people did not. You may be one of them in the future as a nursing researcher. I hope you are. You've got Albert Einstein. You've got Isaac Newton, Galileo, Marie Curie, Charles Darwin, Stephen Hawking, Michael Faraday, Nicholas Capendus, Aristotle. Isaac Newton, his law of gravity, gravitation. Albert Einstein, his theory of relativity, understanding space, time, gravity, and the universe. He was a theoretical physicist, a cosmopologist. Then you've got Charles Darwin, the British naturalist, who's credited with the theory of natural selection. Marie Curie, French physicist, chemist, pioneer in the study of radiation. She discovered elements radium and polonium, and she was awarded the Nobel Prize, as most of these people were within the right era. Nobel Prize of Physics and Chemistry. Then you've got our most recent Stephen Hawking, who was first to set out a theory of cosmology and explained the union of general theory of relativity and quantum mechanics. I don't understand it. He was a vigorous supporter of many interpretations of quantum mechanics. He was a scientist. These scientists saw things and did things that others did not. Scientists ask questions about the world. And the reasons that they ask the questions is because they don't know the answers. And to answer the questions, they have to make observations. 
they have to perform experiments and these provide more observations. They use logic or reasoning to explain their findings. An example of logic is the process of coming to the conclusion of who didn't come to the class based on who was in the class at the time. Or when we observe online who actually attended the lecture, answered the questions, participated in the discussion, and who did not. That's an example of logic. And scientific information has got a tentative nature. As I mentioned previously, scientific information is considered to be tentative in nature. It's not absolute. However, scientists use this information to answer questions about the world that they have. The explanation and findings are the answers to their questions. But everybody asks, how do we know it's the correct answer? And science uses a very rigid, structured, operational procedure to determine correctness through the explanations of their findings. The tentative nature of scientific knowledge isn't absolute. That's what it means. Tentative na you cannot claim absolute truth in science. The tentative nature of scientific knowledge also means that it may change. The laws and theories or what the findings are may change. And I'll give you examples of that as we go through. We talk about a hypothesis. And a hypothesis is called a tentative statement. And that's because it wasn't tested. It's because you didn't test the supposed statement or the outcome. So the hypothesis essentially is an educated guess of what will happen. And the reason why a hypothesis is said to be a tentative statement is that the outcome of the experiment will confirm what was initially predicted or it might refute it. It might say, yes, it's true, or it might say, no, it's not true. A hypothesis is considered to be a tentative or not an absolute statement. It's really just a guess. So when we look at a tentative nature of scientific information, this is when scientists first explain a finding or an answer. And at this stage, it's called a model or a hypothesis. The model or hypothesis is tested and it's tested experimentally. And testing the hypothesis means collecting more data, information, observations. And if the model or hypothesis is tested many, 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 many times with the same findings, it's probably going to be considered correct. So let's look at an example. The example is, imagine that we have a theory concerning the relationship between television habits, you're watching t TV all the time, and obesity. And according to the theory, there's a correlation between the amount of television that people watch and their obesity levels. Our theory, however, doesn't assume that this correlation is due to a causal relationship between the two variables. The two variables are obesity and watching TV. But rather, our theory assumes that exercise causally influences obesity and that people tend to get less exercise when they're watching TV. An example. Given this simple theory, there's a number of hypotheses or, th or guesses that we can derive. And these are just a few. There will be a positive correlation between television viewing and obesity. 
there will be a negative correlation between the time spent exercising and obesity. There will be a negative correlation between TV viewing and the time spent exercising. If we hold exercise constant, we will not observe a correlation between television viewing and obesity. In science, a hypothesis is an idea or an explanation and then you test through study and experimentation. You test through observation and experimentation. Okay, let's look at an example of a nursing model. This is Orem's self-care deficit model and this was originated from a grand nursing theory that was developed by Orem between 1959 and 2001. And the theory is also referred to Orem's model of nursing. And she used it particularly with rehabilitation and in primary care settings where patients were encouraged to be as independent as possible. So when you look at Orem's self-care deficit model, it evolved into a theory in 2001 because it was utilized and utilized and utilized and researched and researched and found to be true. So this is when scientists first establish a hypothesis. And after it's established, it becomes a new model. And if the model, as I just indicated, or the hypothesis is tested over and over and over many times with the same findings, which means it's reproducible from other researchers, then the findings are considered reliable and it becomes a theory. So Oram's self-care deficit model, 1959, became a theory in 2001. And it was ultimately combined into the nursing process because the scientific theories have got explanatory power, which means they explain what is happening, cause and effect. However, as scientific information remains tentative, as we indicated, which means not absolute, things can change. It's only provisional because future research, future observations may indicate that the information needs to be revised. Who knows? Rehabilitation may change in a hundred years. Primary care may change in a hundred years. So scientific knowledge is considered to be tentative. It's only provisional. It may change over a period of time. Have a look at this. This is what we're talking about when we talk about the tentative nature of scientific information. And this is just an example. The thalidomide disaster in 1957. You probably don't know about it. You're too young. But maybe you do. I don't know. This is considered to be one of the darkest episodes in pharmacological history or pharmaceutical research history. Thalidomide was marketed or sold as a mild sleeping pill. It was considered safe for everybody, even pregnant women. It was also an antiemetic for morning sickness for the same pregnant women. However, it caused thousands of babies worldwide to be born with malformed limbs. However, look at the time period, 1957, 1962. The damage that was done by this medication wasn't revealed till 1962. You do the math. The first appearance of thalidomide was actually in Germany on the 1st of October 1957. 
And as I said, it was marketed as a sedative with apparently few side effects. The drug company at that time who developed it believed it was safe and suitable to prescribe for pregnant women to combat their morning sickness. The results were catastrophic. This baby here grew into a child. The child grew into an adult. And I've shown you nice pictures, which I don't consider nice because some of the other babies were even more horrific. Really sad. Poor kids. Scientific information is tentative in nature. It changes. Evidence-based research is very important. Let's review what subjectivity is. And you've got to remember, you as well. You, as a scientist, for example, have different views. So every scientist lives in a culture, a specific time, holds certain views, and these can change. Subjective things are related to your own ideas, your experiences, your opinions. There isn't a universal truth. It's not rigid. It's extremely flexible. Different cultures, West, for example, versus East, bring an alternative experience of existence that explains their life, a specific event, phenomena in a different way. However, remember, West isn't best and East isn't least. Subjectivity is as follows. The Earth has one moon is an objective statement. It's a fact. The Earth does only have one moon. This is objective. However, if you convert that to a subjective view, the moon is beautiful. However, other people may consider that the moon isn't beautiful at all. They may consider it to be a religious object, have a different view for everybody. Scientific knowledge, however, is purely objective. It's an objective description. The Earth has only one moon. The moon is definitely cylindrical. There's no life on the moon. It's an objective description of a real structure of the world. And as a natural science, there's no scope for any subjective elements. Scientific knowledge does not include subjective data. It has to be observable, experimented with, measurable. Okay, let's review inference. Inference is presumptions. And evidence in relation to presumptions, what's their role? Well, in science, we already said, science is empirical. And it's the process of obtaining empirical data. Then the researcher or the scientist has inferences, what he presumes about the data. And the data, as we already said, is obtained from observations and evidence, facts, not fiction. Inference, for example, it's a conclusion reached on the basis of evidence and reasoning. So consider a woman has a diaper in her hand. She's got vomitus, we'll call it spit up, on her shirt. And there's a bottle warming on the counter. You can infer from this observation that this woman is probably a mother and has a baby. That's inference. So using a scientific approach, you observe something of interest, that's the phenomena. You think and reflect about the phenomena, you develop a provisional explanation, you develop a method for investigating that phenomena, 
and this provides new research data. You reflect on the data, which is new. You refine the findings, answers, explanations, and then you might investigate further. Scientific knowledge is evidence obtained from observations and reasoning which is inferential. You presume. Now let's review tools which are employed in scientific inquiry. Well, you've already done them. We've already mentioned them. This is observation using your five senses, sight, hearing, taste, touch, smell, use in experiments. When studying in relation to observation, it's something that describes only facts that you can see, touch, taste, smell here. You're not making any guesses. It's not an opinion. It's factual. So for example, when we look at Homer Simpson, ah, his observation, this liquid is green and it's leaking from a brown can and it smells like a sewer. He's using sight, smell. They're the two observable tools that he's using. It's not an opinion. Now let's review the scientific method. And the process of the scientific method involves making conjectures or a hypothesis, deriving predictions from them as logical consequences and then carrying out experiments or making empirical observations based on your predictions or your hypothesis. And then the scientists test the hypothesis by conducting experiments or studies which we've already said. So the scientific method then is a series of processes that researchers can use to one, gather knowledge about the world around them, improve that knowledge, gaining more of that knowledge, attempt to explain why and or how things occur, cause and effect. This method involves making observations, forming questions, making a hypothesis, doing an experiment, analyzing the data, forming a conclusion, and disseminating the findings. They're the steps. They're the steps in the scientific method. So if we look at the little cartoon, the scientific method is just one way or a way of thinking about a problem forming a hypothesis, selecting a specific variable at a time and testing it. An example could be the radio doesn't work. Is it plugged in? Is the volume turned up? Is it tuned to a station? Is a fuse blown? Is there a loose wire? The scientific method. Okay. This is an example of the scientific method and the steps. And the exact, the, the exact steps of the scientific method vary from source to source, but the general procedure is basically the same. You're, you're wanting to acquire knowledge through observation and testing. Now, the step that I haven't included here is the first one, you've made an observation about something. So just pretend you're in your clinical practicums and you've seen something that you don't agree with. Or you've seen something here that concerns you or you've seen something that interests you, it sparks your curiosity. So, you make an observation, that's the first step. Then, you ask a question, followed by doing a background research investigation to see whether anybody else has encountered this problem and ask the same question. Then you construct a hypothesis. You make a prediction. You're thinking, gee, I mean, it's probably related to this. Then you test your hypothesis by doing an experiment using a specific methodology and research design. And you analyze your data from your, and you draw certain conclusions about what you found. 
Then you write your results up and you disseminate your information in relation to here whether the hypothesis was correct or not correct. This is the scientific method. As I said, the first step is making an observation. This is about you. You've got to notice something and think about something in relation to the phenomena occurring. That's the whole point. And the scientific method is used when someone doesn't know why, how, or something's occurring and wants to uncover the answer. One of the research projects that I did, I wanted to know why nurses were not caring about their patients, called patient advocacy. I wanted to know why they weren't doing it. So that was what concerned me. Well, that wasn't what concerned me. What concerned me was patient safety. I mean, when you've got a premature neonate or a full-term neonate or a child or an adult and people are not doing what they're supposed to be doing because they're not being professional and caring, that's a concern. So it's when someone wants to know why or how or something's occurring and wants to uncover the answer. But before you can do that or even question it, you've got to know something is happening. You've got to understand something is worrying you. Something is concerning you. It may be positive. Something may be making you very happy. Why are all these nurses being really caring to their patients? Why are they doing it? I haven't observed it somewhere else. Then you've got to ask the question. And the question is based on your observations in relation to why or how is this thing occurring. The scientific, back, the, the scientific method actually starts when you ask the question about something that you observe. How, what, when, who, which, why, where. Asking a question defines the problem or the issue which you want to resolve. In reality, you make both observations and ask questions at the same time. It's basically around the same time. You're saying, why is this occurring? And then it's important to do a background search, to learn what others have discovered about your topic or what they haven't discovered about your topic. An example could be that if you find an answer to why something's occurring, you may want to go a step further and figure out how it occurs. Step three, forming the hypothesis. You know, a, a scientific hypothesis, mm. it's the initial building block in the scientific method. And many, many, many academics describe it as an educated guess. And it's based on prior knowledge and your observation. The hypothesis also includes an explanation of why your guess may be correct. It's just an educated guess of what will happen during the experiment. And as I indicated earlier, the hypothesis is also a tentative statement because you haven't actually tested it. It's supposed to be what you suppose it will be. It's the reason why the hypothesis is said to be tentative. It's just a prediction. But it's supposed to answer the question posed in step two. Now, a hypothesis can be specific or it can be more general. Depends on your question. Your question is the most important thing in relation to the research process. Because that's why you're doing the research. You want to answer the question. But also, you've got to remember that in the scientific method, the hypothesis has to be testable. You have to be able to test it. If a hypothesis, if a hypothesis is not testable, then it's impossible to perform the experiment to determine whether it's supported by evidence. Now, the next step is performing the experiment. In the scientific method, an experiment is an empirical procedure 
that arbitrates competing models or hypotheses. It looks at them. The researchers also use experimentation to test existing theories or new hypotheses to support or disprove them. And there are two main variables in an experiment and they're considered to be the independent and the dependent variable. The independent variable is the variable that is changed or controlled in your scientific experiment to test the effects of the dependent variable. The dependent variable is the variable being tested and measured in the experiment. So, an experiment has got to have an independent variable, for example, exercise, which is something that is manipulated by the person doing the experiment, you, the researcher, and the dependent responding variable, example, weight, which is the thing being measured and which may be affected by the independent variable. All other variables, for example, diet, medication, age, gender, have to be controlled so they don't affect the outcome. And it's during an experiment that the data is collected, the data is set of values, and the data can be quantitative, measurable, or it can be qualitative, which is just a description, subjective. Or it can be more objective by just saying yes or no. Step five, analyzing the data. Now, data analysis is just a process of interpreting the meaning of the data that you've collected, organized, or displayed in the form of a table or a graph in the scientific method. So after performing an experiment and collecting all the data, you've got to analyze it. So research experiments in the scientific method are usually analyzed with statistical software in order to determine relationships between the data. In the case of a simpler experiment, the researcher might look at the data and see how it correlated with the change in the independent variable. Step six is formulating a conclusion. And this step is supposed to support the hypothesis which is called the true hypothesis, which may explain the phenomena. It's also important to make sure that the sample size, the number of observations made, is big enough so the data isn't skewed. Skewness in statistics is the degree of distortion of all or the symmetrical curve in the bell, which is the normal distribution. A normal distribution has got a skew of zero. If the data doesn't support the hypothesis, this is a false hypothesis, then more observations need to be made. Or you may have to formulate a new hypothesis and you have to do the scientific method all over again. When a conclusion is made, the research can be presented to others to inform them of your findings and receive input about the validity of the conclusions drawn from the research. Your conclusions basically summarize how the results support or contradict your original hypothesis. The last step is the reporting of the results. And this is to present the results of the paper and they're presented in a logical order using whatever figures, tables, graphs that you did or have which are necessary and they explain the results to show how they help answer your research question or questions that you initially posed in the introduction. The evidence, however, doesn't explain itself. The results have to be presented and then explained. Also, it's to disseminate and provide information regarding your research work, which means don't do the research and hide it, present it. Journals, conferences, local or international. So it's to present the methods, the data analysis conclusion in a systematic, scientific and acknowledged manner. 
and in this way it elicits crucial facts about the phenomena and the solution derived from your findings in the research. Okay, let's just quickly review the scientific method. You've got to have observed something. Something is bugging you. Something is troubling you. Something is concerning you. Something is pleasing you. There's a phenomena that you want to investigate. Then you ask a question, followed by a background literature search. Then you construct a hypothesis or make a prediction. You test the hypothesis by doing an experiment using a specific recognized methodology. Then you analyze your data and draw a conclusion, following which you report your findings and determine whether your hypothesis was correct or incorrect, true or false. Now the scientific method relates to what is called positivism. Positivism is a term that's used to describe an approach to study of society that relies on scientific data, scientific evidence, such as statistics, experiments, numbers, to reveal the true nature of how society operates. Positivism is a philosophical theory stating that certain positive knowledge is based on natural phenomena and their properties and their relations. Positivism is typically quantitative. It's a quantitative research approach. Scientific inquiry challenges subjective data, which basically what it means is quantitative scientists or scientists or researchers using the scientific method do not believe in qualitative research because qualitative research from their perspective is subjective. It's not measurable. So for example, look at the cartoon. You know, homopathy has zero evidence, is no more effective than a placebo, and is propagated by people who want to exploit you for money, right? And what she's basically saying is, really? Because homeopathy isn't conventional or considered conventional scientific medicine. The criticisms of the scientific method in relation to positivism are that scientific method scientists are skeptics, they're doubters. They challenge unconfirmed observations and subjective data. The studies they believe are often repetitive and verify similar findings. The research becomes expensive and is time consuming. Look, it is time consuming. Well, it depends on the methodology that you use. The scientific method is a quantitative methodology which uses numbers and the questions focus on ethical and moral issues they can't be measured. For example, the issue of euthanasia, no study can determine whether euthanasia is right or wrong. You cannot study the complexity of the human experience with the scientific method. Each person is considered to be unique has a unique mental capacity, a unique culture, unique values, personality, measurement issues with certain phenomena, compassion, mourning, suffering, illness experience. Are we able to measure it? I don't think so. There are control issues. So can you really control all the extraneous variables? Their criticisms related to the scientific method. It's too rigid. It's too fixed. It's not flexible. And there are questions related to whether really you can remain neutral as an observer, as a researcher, and control everything. The social reality, or an alternative view, is that nursing knowledge, put this into your minds now, because you're going to have to make a decision about what you do in the future as a researcher. Quantitative, qualitative, mixed method using both. Nursing knowledge is considered to be multidimensional. It's about people, not numbers. It's about viewing patients as unique human beings and it considers patients in a social context and the dynamics in their clinical setting. And it focuses on understanding human experiences, 
which you can't get in a like it scale, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, good, maybe, sure. Qualitative knowledge or research focuses on patients and or healthcare professional experiences. It helps ensure patients are viewed as people, as human beings, as individuals, rather than a diagnosis or a number or a medical condition. And it can generate information that informs you as nurses about clinical decisions. And it's especially useful in the nursing literature when little is known about the topic because it's qualitative research that discovers new issues that the quantitative researchers or researchers that use the scientific method use. They need the qualitative data first to determine whether they can do other research. So let's review the research process. You've got essentially qualitative and quantitative. So let's look at the purpose, the criteria. The purpose of qualitative research is to understand and interpret social interactions. The quantitative is to test a hypothesis, to check the cause and effect, to develop predictions for the future. In qualitative, the studied group is typically small and selected intentionally. This is called purposive sampling. There's a purpose to the sampling. In the studied group, for the quantitative, you look at larger, much larger groups, and they're selected randomly. When you look at the data type, well, this is words, images, objects. When you look at quantitative, it's numbers and statistics. When you look at the form of the data, typically it's open-ended questions in interviews. Interviews can be face-to-face -face or they can be um, uh, called group interviews or focus group interviews. Or you can actually observe and have field notes. In quantitative, it's precise, exact, structured measurements, instruments for data collection. Data analysis typically focuses on patterns, features, themes in the identification. Data analysis in the quantitative is statistical. The researcher's role in qualitative research, they may be known to the participants. In the study, the participants have characteristics that are known to the researcher. In my research, I looked at critical care nurses. Critical care nurses, neonatal, pediatric and adult, surgical ICU, oncology ICU, neonatal ICU, etc. And I knew them all because I was their clinical nurse specialist. I specifically chose them because I wanted to find out what they had to offer as new data. And it was new data, unique. The researcher's role in quantitative well, the researcher and their biases are not known. They're supposed to be neutral to the participants in the study and the participants' characteristics are typically hidden. When it comes to the results in a qualitative study, the findings are typically less gen gen generalizable. I would argue that, but it says typically less generalizable from my perspective. However, the research findings in a quantitative are more generalizable and can be applied to other populations. This is the research process. And sometimes there's a combination too, which they call a mixed methodology, where you combine both. So what are the implications for you as professional nurses and your practice? Well, both qualitative and quantitative research are important in the development of nursing knowledge and practice. That's a fact. However, the traditional so-called scientific methods of investigation generally have their foundations in positive quantitative philosophies and don't always fit the dynamic, complicated world in human sciences such as nursing. Nursing's unique in terms of knowledge and appears the qualitative is more appropriate rather than the traditional methods. It's also evident that there are some aspects of knowledge that are significantly advanced by qualitative research. 
especially regarding beliefs about health, illness, attitudes and behaviours. And as with knowledge from any source, look, it's provisional and subject to revision. Things can change in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. And despite being a newer strategy with critics, qualitative research contributes to nursing knowledge and can be used to enhance patient care. It's about people, it's not about numbers. Okay, to conclude, this is just a self-directed review for you. You can go back, you can review the assumptions and nature of science, the tools that are employed in scientific inquiry, what the scientific method actually is. What are some of the criticisms of positivism and the scientific method? And what's an alternative view of social reality? Which again, from my perspective, has to be a qualitative approach. And then look at the implications for professional nursing practice what you're doing. Okay, thanks. Thanks again. And if you found this of any value, come and have a look at some of the other Dr. Manny Learn Shops on YouTube. Bye for now.